Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures on Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. You're either watching this video because you're in my class or you stumbled across it in YouTube. Uh, if you're in YouTube land and you just stumbled across my videos, please know that I'm presenting these videos specifically to the students who are enrolled in my courses in the manner that I want them to learn the material. You need to learn it the way that your instructor wants you to learn it. They may cover different information, more information or more in depth, um, and they may not cover some of the things that I cover. So make sure you pay attention to what your instructors want. For the rest of you, learn it the way that I want you to learn it, and then we will add all that superficial detail uh, in the future that I may leave out. Now, we've been doing tissues of the body. We've gone through epithelium, we've gone through all the connective tissues. We're almost done with the tissue chapter, but there's a little bit more stuff that we have to do. If you're following along in my notes set, we have just finished the membranes of the body and we're going to be doing the bottom of page 34, the connective tissue framework of the body. Now the connective tissue framework of the body is really this type of connective tissue that really does exactly that. It helps connect everything else together and it provides a framework for the body. There are three major parts to the connective tissue framework of the body. There's one that's called the superficial fascia. We've already talked about the superficial fascia a little bit when we talked about the skin because it is the layer that is just below the skin. Remember when we studied in laboratory and when we look at the skin, there are three layers that we talk about, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Only the first two layers make up the skin, the epidermis and dermis. The hypodermis is also called the superficial fascia or the subcutaneous layer. Remember, your skin is the cutaneous membrane. That adipose tissue has several functions. Number one, it provides padding, some of the pads of our body where we're supposed to bump into the outside world so it doesn't hurt when we hit bone on um, something hard. So it's, a, it's a, sort of a padding and, and shock absorber. It also can store nutrients. Um, adipose tissue is rich in lipids and lipids can be converted to energy. So that's one of the functions of the superficial fascia. It is the adipose tissue or the uh, subcutaneous layer. That's all you really need to know about it. Um, the next one is called the deep fascia. The deep fascia is several layers of what we call dense irregular connective tissue. Dense irregular is similar to dense connective tissue, but very often it can have multiple layers. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at plywood from the edge, not, not looking big flat sheet, but if we look at the edge of plywood, if you look at it, you'll see that all the wood fibers on one layer are going one direction. The next layer, you're staring at the ends of the fibers. The next layer, the fibers might be running at another direction. So there's multiple layers and the wood fibers are running in different directions. It's almost as if I take my fingers and stack one set this way, one set this way, another this way, another this way, and then another one. I would have multiple layers of fibers running different directions. This allows it to withstand stresses from numerous directions, okay? So it provides a lot of strength and stability. Um, one of the other things that some of these uh, connective tissue framework can do is not only connect things, but they provide a route for lots of blood vessels and things to flow through. Blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves flow in these, in these layers. So, um, Before I move on to the next one, one of the things I want you to know about this, the deep fascia is that the deep fascia very often is described as the capsule that surrounds certain organs. Like um, our adrenal gland has uh, an adrenal capsule. The kidneys have a renal capsule. Those capsules are very often made up of this uh, deep fascia, okay? Uh, and it's also uh, part of the periosteum and the perichondrium. Um, they're, they're what we call a deep fascia, some dense connective tissue. Now, the third layer is called the um, subserous fascia. Subserous means below the serous membrane. And they're not always below the serous membrane, but they are somewhat interwoven with the serous membranes. Um, and it's a, it's a tissue that is somewhat associated with the serous membranes. And really what some of these what, what the superficial and the subserous fascia can do is they help stabilize the organs because some of our organs are just hanging in the cavity and they help stabilize them so that when we move around, they don't, um, 
the organs are somewhat held in place. It provides a lot of support for them, okay? Um, anyway, I think that's all I want you to know about those. I want you to know that there's three layers to the connective tissue, or three different types of structures that are associated with the connective tissue membrane or the, uh, of the body, the connective tissue network. Uh, and that would be the, the superficial fascia or hypodermis, stores nutrients and provides some padding and insulation. There's the deep fascia, which is uh, more capsular. It's lots of a dense, irregular connective tissue running in different directions, and it's, it provides some stability. And then there's the subserous fascia, which is uh, somewhat between the serous membrane and an organ or a serous membrane and the wall. And they do a little bit of connectivity and stabilization so that things aren't, that, so, so the serous membranes aren't freely moving. They're held in place but the two different serous membranes slide against each other. I know that's not super clear. That's not exactly how I wanted this to come out, but you know, look them up and read about them, but I've told you what I want you to know about each one, okay? Um, we're gonna move on to page 35, and we're gonna start, we're, we're not gonna talk about the different types of muscle tissue because we have an entire test dedicated to muscle tissue. What you need to know about muscle tissue for my class, for, for the tissue exam is one thing, all tissue, all muscle tissue contracts to move things, okay? We'll talk about the different types of muscle tissue when we do that test. And then the last one is neural tissue. We said that neural tissue carries information within the body in the form of an electrical impulse called an action potential. Right now, that's the only thing I want you to know about neural tissue, okay? We will go into more detail in lecture tests five and six in my class. So later on, we'll go into much more detail into neural tissue, all right? Um, so now that's going to take us on to tissue injury and repair. And these are some definitions. Since most of the students taking human anatomy and physiology are going to be clinicians, you're going to be seeing these words a lot. So I'm a big word nerd. I think knowing words and um, knowing roots and prefixes and suffixes helps you very often answer questions or figure things out. When you recognize part of a word, you can make a pretty solid educated guess of what it means. So I'm gonna go over these definitions with you. They're listed in my note set. They're straight out of the chapter. So let's talk about it. If you're near the bottom of page 35, these are the definitions that I want you to know. Anything outside of this, you don't have to worry about for now, okay? Um, the first one listed on the page is inflammation. It has almost the word flame in it. When you think of flames, what do you think of? You think redness, you think of increased temperature or heat, and here we're going to get some swelling. When we talk about um, when we talk about inflammation, we're talking about redness, swelling, and sometimes if you put your hand on it, you can sometimes feel some warmth or increased temperature. Not always, but usually. But redness and swelling are definitely what we call inflammation. When a tissue is inflamed, it means it's red and swollen, and it's due to some kind of damage, okay? Usually inflammation is due to physical damage, like a blister, or if you bang your knee, if you hit something and you get you know, some redness on your knuckles, or you fell down and you got a little bit of swelling somewhere in your body, that is inflammation in the tissue. That's all that it means. Now the next term, infection, is inflammation, but for a different reason. So we can say that it's redness, increased temperature, and swelling in a tissue. But this is due to the presence of what we call pathogens, the generators of pathology. So pathogens, that begs what's the definition of a pathogen? A pathogen, I don't always like this definition, but nonetheless, the definition is any organism that can cause disease. Or any disease causing organism. They can do damage to your body. But viruses are not really a living organism, so I don't really like that definition, but it's one that's used commonly. 
So this would include things like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites are the main culprits. There's a few others. But when your body gets invaded by bacteria, you have a bacterial or viral infection or fungal infection or parasitic infection, those are infections. This is distinctly different than just inflammation. When someone says you have inflammation, the indication is it's usually due to physical damage. If there is a pathogen present that's causing the redness and the swelling, then we call that definitely an infection. That is the key. It has pathogens present. Okay. Now, if you get a cut, you might have some inflammation. If it starts to get really red and sore and you see pus and stuff developing, then you know you have an infection. There's a pathogen in there. Okay. So I'm going to erase these terms so that we have room to write the next ones. There's another term. <clears throat> the next term on the list is regeneration. Well, to generate means to make. To regenerate means to remake. And so when we talk about regeneration, or you'll hear it sometimes said, uh, called tissue regeneration. But when you read a doctor's notes and say, we see moderate uh, gener regeneration, blah, blah, blah. Generate, regeneration is simply healing, okay? The tissue is starting to heal. It is the regrowth and or repair of tissue damage. So if you break a bone, when it starts healing, we would say that the bone tissue is regenerating. It's starting to repair itself or heal itself. That's all that regeneration means. Now, the opposite of regeneration is necrosis. And you'll sometimes hear the term necrotic tissue. Anytime you hear necro, necro means death. So when we have tissue necrosis, it's the death of the tissue. So necrosis is just dead or dying tissue. You've cut off the blood supply to the tissue so the cells start dying or there's an infection where the, the infection is eating up the tissue and you're seeing necrosis, okay? For example, pus is a, is, a, is a sign of necrosis. There's some tissue necrosis going on and the tissue is necrotic. And very often you have to go in and scrape away the dead tissue and regeneration can and will occur sometimes if treated properly, okay? Now, one form of tissue necrosis we said was pus. Now, pus is an accumulation of dead or dying cells and cellular debris. So, if I have some skin here and I have a little rip in the skin, which we would call a laceration. If some bacteria got into the tissue and the tissue starts dying, and we start seeing pus appear around it. And around that, it's very, very red and swollen and inflamed. Then that is pus. And essentially what it is, is the cells in the tissue, and sometimes your white blood cells coming in to fight this, are being slaughtered, and you're seeing the dead bodies of these cells sort of building up in the tissue. It's a sign that your body is losing the battle to the infection or um, that you have restricted blood flow and the tissue is starting to die and rot. It's dead or rotting tissue. It's an accumulation of it, okay? Now the next definition that we're gonna cover is called an abscess. An abscess is pus, but that is closed off to the outside world. It's, it's an underlying pocket of pus. So when we talk about an abscess, people hear about an abscessed tooth, right? An abscess is an enclosed pocket of pus, or we could say an enclosed pocket of dead or dying tissue. 
So let's say someone gets stabbed with a needle or you step on a nail, and when you remove it, your body seals up the wound. So we don't really see where the wound is, but a few little bacteria came off in the process. Well, your body is filled with carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And our cells need the same thing that bacterial cells need. So the bacteria start reproducing like crazy and multiplying because they have a virtual buffet of tissue for themselves. And our body, our immune cells, and our fibroblasts, when they respond to the wound, the fibroblasts can actually start to lay down some collagen fibers and some fibrous tissue and try to wall off the infection so it cannot spread. Kind of like sealing off a room with bad guys in it and then you try to attack it. And so that enclosed pocket of pus, as we fight this battle and pus starts to build up in here, we call that an abscess. It's not open to the external environment, it's an enclosed pocket of pus deep in the tissue. They get underneath your teeth and sometimes people get an abscess tooth, the bacteria get in there, or you get abscesses in certain parts of the body, okay? Now, um, the next term on the list is a biopsy. Bio always means life, and the C comes from psych, which ability to see or think, but nonetheless. Um, biopsy is this, it is a removal of a sample of tissue for pathologic analysis. We're gonna analyze the tissue to see what is causing the pathology, what's causing the disease state, what's causing the inflammation, what's causing the infection or whatever. So sometimes doctors will remove a sample of tissue, they send it to a laboratory, and usually there's a doctor there called a pathologist who studies all of the tissues of the body and all the histology and when you send them a sample, you might say this is a sample of the cervix of the uterus. Like when someone gets a pap smear, when a female gets a pap smear, because there's a part of the uterus called the cervix where cells tend to sometimes divide uncontrollably and form small tumors, sometimes cancerous ones, they take a little snippet of tissue off from a few spots and send it to a pathologist. They look at it under a microscope. If it looks normal, no big deal. If it looks abnormal, they have to address it. That would be called pathologic analysis. So the pathologist is gonna analyze tissue, a sample of tissue to see if it looks normal. There's breast biopsies, there's biopsies of all sorts of tumors and lymph nodes and things. They take little samples of tissue out during a surgical procedure, send it off for analysis to see what's causing your pathology. That's all that a biopsy is, is the removal of the tissue, okay? Um, now, we're done with page 35, I believe. We're moving on to page 36 of the note set. I just want to make sure I'm covering these definitions in the exact same order that they appear for you guys. Okay? Um, and oh, here's my next page. Excuse me as I step off. Once we do the biopsy, right? Once a pathologist does a biopsy, they're going to send a report. And that report will very often um, have some of this language, possibly. So... One of the terms is called dysplasia. The dys means not, and plasia refers to shape or form, okay? Like plastic can be molded into multiple shapes. So in dysplasia, one of the things that dysplasia denotes when you see that term is, basically it is a um, abnormal appearance, I'm going to switch markers because that one seems to be losing some color. And or organization of the tissue. It usually does not disrupt tissue function. Also, it's very often reversible, meaning your body can heal it without a lot of intervention. 
So essentially, dysplasia means the tissue looks a little beat up. A good example would be a blister. When you have a blister, your skin doesn't look normal there. It's disorganized. It doesn't look normal. It doesn't disrupt the functioning of the tissue for the most part. It's still performing the functions of your skin. It might be a little sore and peel off, but there's still some skin underneath it. And your body will heal it. It's reversible. So that's a good example of dysplasia. The next degree of, as I like to say, messed up upness is called metaplasia. Meta means above, okay? In metaplasia, you have an abnormal appearance or organization of a tissue. that disrupts tissue function. This means the tissue can't perform its functions normally. It's so beat up and so messed up that its functioning is, dis is messed up. Um, it might be reversible, it may not. Uh, it may need some intervention. When you get to metaplasia, that's when a doctor goes, hmm, we really need to take a serious look at this and cause, see what the underlying cause is and see if we can address it. The tissue looks beat up, it looks disorganized, and it's not performing its normal function, okay? That's one of the huge differences is one disrupts tissue function, the other one does not disrupt tissue function, got it? The worst of the three of these is one called anaplasia. Ana means without or not, and this means you have a total loss of tissue, and I can't find a marker that writes neatly enough or continues to write well, appearance and function. The tissue is completely not very recognizable at all, okay? It disrupts the appearance. It completely breaks down the function. It is usually irreversible without medical intervention, okay? So, I think of it this way. Say you work at a restaurant and you have a friend who's a bartender at that restaurant. And they come in one weekend with a black eye and a busted lip and um, a bloody knuckle or something. They're still going to be, or a busted up knuckle, they're still going to be able to mix drinks and do their job. You might walk in and go, hey, what happened to you? And, oh, I was in a car accident or I got in a fight. Okay. So they can still come in and mix their drinks. They're a little messed up, but they can perform their function and they'll go back to normal eventually. Now, imagine the same bartender comes in a few weeks after that, and not only do they look a little bit beat up, but they might have a splint on their hand, on their wrist. So they're not able to completely do their job. They might be able to pour drinks, but they may not be able to wash dishes with their splint on or something. So it can disrupt their functions. Might be reversible, they might need some medical help. In anaplasia, that would be like your bartender comes in and they're missing all their limbs. They've lost their arms and their legs, or they're completely casted in their arms. They're not gonna be able to grab bottles, pour drinks, wash dishes, they can't do their job. They've completely lost their function and their appearance. So these are varying degrees of damage to a tissue. And these terms are used when you see a medical report like, oh, we see some mild dysplasia, doesn't look like anything to worry about. Or we see some metaplasia and we want the patient to come back and maybe take another look, take a few more samples. If you have anaplasia, well, you should be concerned. You should seek medical attention, okay? So those are the definitions that I wanted to go over with you. Um, I hope that you guys learned these definitions and you're able to answer them for exams because you're gonna be using this language a lot in the future. Uh, the last thing in the tissue section is what effect does aging have on tissue re uh, repair? You should read that. Read the section on tissue repair. As we age, our ability, especially once, I mean, for a while, we, our ability to repair tissue grows and becomes better. But as we reach a certain age, 
mid to late 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, our body's ability to regenerate the tissue to heal declines with age for a number of reasons. So read that section on your own. Take a few notes on it. I'm probably not going to test on that, but you should be curious to learn things simply to learn them, not because they're on an exam. Um, if you want to get good at this and be good at your job as a clinician, you're going to have to want to learn things because you should know them, not simply because someone's going to test you on them. So anyway, that's going to wrap up the tissue chapter. Um, I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope you learned something. I hope that you enjoyed the process. And I need you to do this stuff until you can't stand it. Do it till you understand it. Then do it five more times. And then do it till you can teach it to somebody else. All right? I'll see you in the next video where we discuss skin and the integumentary system. Thanks for watching.